Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Brockton Bay Chronicles. My name's Keith. I'm here with my good friend, Andy. We're continuing Andy's first time reading of Worm by Wild Bo. Andy, how you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty well. I'm still recovering from our last episode and all the zingers that Tony threw my way, but <laughs> but I've healed up sufficiently, I think, and I'm ready for this next section. And speaking of which, we'll be reviewing Arc 19, Scourge, chapters 1 to 3, and the first interlude. And as far as new business, we will be taking a break after we finish this arc. Yes, we will. Everything times up to where uh, Christmas will be rolling through, Christmas, New Year. So we're going to set our mics down for a little bit, spend some quality time with the families and relax, and then we'll come back ready to roll. And with that announcement of news, we are ready to move on to our review. And we are starting Arc 19, Chapter 1, Scourge. And here we go. We find ourselves in a familiar scene. Taylor's in the school, and she's experiencing some abuse. It's kind of a dream sequence We, as the way Wild Bull sets this out. Uh, pounding rhythms. It describes the way the students were kind of milling around. Some of them were running into her. The first contact that she has is, it says here, uh, someone tall shoved past me and his bag caught my nose. It tore at the skin between the nostrils and I could feel the warm blood fountaining from the wound. So at this moment, we know Taylor's has been absorbed inside Echidna and we find her back in the school you probably figured right away that it was some kind of a dream sequence. Yeah, I picked up on that pretty quick. Uh, the The question that still kind of sticks with me, I guess, is just the little bit I understand about dreams. You know, you've got all the random firings going on in your head. If you're going in REM, your eyelids might be fluttering, so you might be getting, you know, little little flashes of vision entering in as well, a little bit of visual data, and then your brain tries to make sense of it, mm -hmm. and you, you end up with these bizarre things. Now, the, the added stuff here is that there's a probably a ton more input for Skitter, not only because she's parahuman, but because she's been absorbed. She's, she's getting crushed or bumped up against stuff, or who mm -hmm. knows what's going on in there. But I wonder how much of it is kind of a side effect of Echidna's power, you know, that she's kind of, all of her clones come out messed up and angry and kind of hyper-focused on one aspect and, and almost always negative or violent. And, and so I wonder how much of the way the dream goes is influenced by Echidna's power kind of picking this stuff out and, and augmenting it or boosting the bad stuff. So it seems even worse than it was. That was my interpretation. Okay. That, yeah, she's been taken in. This is what Echidna wanted, and she's torturing them. Skitter does briefly talk about this later on when she's uh, trying to comfort Gru. She knows mm. she kind of had an idea what, he saw when he was had been absorbed. So my thought was, yeah, this is Echidna beginning to exact her revenge. Aside from the, the fact that we know she can physically mutilate these people, mm -hmm. generating, using her power, I'm presuming, using her power, she's generating these, the very worst images or feelings, sensations that uh, any of her victims can imagine and presenting it to them. And they're having to cope. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I figured. The, the use of the bugs. How did you feel about the way Wild Bull presented this? Now, as we're going through this chapter and we are presented the POV from inside Skitter's head, and then every now and then we get this external view. Do you feel it was effectively set up the way he did this? And then later on in this chapter, as we're bouncing from this dream state to the visions of the bugs, did you think that it was fairly set up? You didn't have to suspend your disbelief too much. No, I thought it was okay. I mean, if 
Skidder had gone in totally incapacitated and been absorbed, you know, while unconscious, then it would have been tough for me to, we know that she affects bugs when she's out, but mm -hmm. we don't know obviously how much input she was having from them or how much she was able to process from them. But the fact that she was conscious when she got absorbed, this seemed almost like a, a power struggle between her power and Echidna's power. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if Skitter had been able to latch on to that external input enough and kind of push down or push aside what Echidna was trying to cause to be happening in her mind, then that would have been kind of cool, but it, that would have been a lot to expect. But, you know, I think, I think this was very believable and it made sense that it would have made less sense to me if Skidder's power was totally shut off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way it stepped from, okay, I, I should have something. I, I know there's something I should be able to reach for. And then suddenly we get that external view and then she's back inside the hallucination and she's getting further abuse. And then she deliberately reaches for a weapon. And then we get another more detailed view from the ex external happenings i thought that was believable i thought it was pretty good uh actually it kept us in touch with what was going on between tattletale bitch and echidna so uh yeah that was pretty satisfying the flip side of that that's kind of interesting is that echidna is devoting this stuff to what's going on inside of her and you don't mm -hmm. know how much of that is kind of just based on her power and just kind of happens or she has to mm focus on but then she's also battling everybody on the outside yeah that's a good point that's kind of a an interesting interplay right you've got both of them operating on two different levels wow yeah because um yeah how much is this is the pardon me how much is this her passenger taking over the uh the mental mm. torture and how much of this is noel right exacting her revenge fascinating question we get a view from outside and Tattletail <laughs> Tattletail is pulling a pin on a grenade and just I believe the phrase is cooking it by hanging mm -hmm. on to it until such time as she feels it's okay to, to let it go. Yeah, that's her power and she's comfortable using her power and taking chances like that. I did not care for the the one point where one of Echid Echidna's tongues reached out and yanked at Tattletail and tried to drag her in. That was <laughs> that was kind of grisly. This, yeah, I, I mean, we keep coming back using the, the the same phrases to describe this situation, and there's just no other way to describe it: grim, gruesome, body horror. <laughs> the scene inside inside one of Taylor's hallucinations right before the the trio shove her in that locker sophia puts a noose around her neck and strains her back and madison is giggling and opens up the locker and they shove her in and then that was a good point where um taylor is inside the locker and it says here um bugs bit at my flesh and there was nothing i could do to stop them bugs there was something i thought i should know something and then it flips to the outside so again uh effectively giving us a reason to believe that she could access her bugs on the outside she could tap into what they were seeing a little bit tap into what they were sensing but not manipulate them right yeah to your point earlier it's almost like if if we go with the theory that it was noel's passenger that's kind of doing this torturing then it's almost like Skidder's passenger is trying to protect her from the torture. You know, as, as Skidder's doing this, you know, she says bugs, there should be, and that activates mm -hmm. the bug linkage, you know, all those neurons and synapses that are wired into that all of a sudden kick in for a while. And there's just this kind of tug of war going on almost over Skidder's consciousness or subconsciousness. I don't know. 
perceptions. It was truly a life and death struggle on the outside between Tattletail and poor bitch. I mean, she's getting these bugs attacking her. At least she had uh, she had one of the dogs to try to protect her body. But Tattletail shoots one of the grooves. They send the dogs in. Clever move. They send a couple of bitches' dogs in and let them get absorbed by Echidna, and she grew them. The whole idea, we find out later on, was Tattletail. She knew that Echidna couldn't absorb dead flesh, and she was hoping to weigh her down with this. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I, this was one part where I, my credibility was strained a little bit. Mm-hmm. Not my credibility, I guess the credibility of the story. Okay. I don't know based on Rachel, that she would be okay sending the dogs in. I mean, even understanding the plan, Tattletail must have proposed it to her and got her to agree. And, but Skinner was always the one that could kind of get through to Rachel. And so it was a little hard for me to take as I read through that, that, wow, would, would Rachel really do that? Well, let me ask you this, though. Well, let me present it to you this way. We can believe that arc one through 13 bitch wouldn't go for it Mm. but where she is now thanks to taylor's help she's grown as a character so i would be inclined to believe that a yeah she's had personal growth as a character and b she might be willing to do this to help her her friend her co pack member skitter who's in dire dire need so i can see tattletail making that argument to rachel and Good point. rachel yeah rachel being able being willing to take that chance and tattletail can probably detect on a certain level how to frame it and how to guide that exactly proposal plan to tap into you know rachel's relationship with skitter yeah okay i see where you're coming from that makes sense we get a scene from all of her battles. We get mm. the final one of the final ones is that situation with mannequin and the nine in the that warehouse and around her were the people in her territory and her dad and uh, Charlotte, I believe. She tries to to battle mannequin like she did before, and it's fruitless because she's in this this hallucination where she's always going to be losing. And it's just one bad thing after another, all her enemies that she's fought over the last number of months. And they're just abusing her. Meanwhile, on the outside, we get a further battle between Tattletail. And now we have a Gru clone and two skitters out there. And the two skitters are, making uh, plans on how to use the resources that are available to them. This grew. I want to touch on that real quick. His power deviation was the ability to teleport. That was a very unfortunate wrinkle. Yeah. They, mm-hmm. <laughs> that threw a, a big monkey wrench in it here for everybody. And it's just kind of wild how, how the clones seem to kind of, adhere to the original but they can have kind of some wild variations too so it it makes it hard to you know you can't predict exactly you just never know what you're going to be getting thrown at you there and it's hard to know how you could even hope to win Mm -hmm. you know you don't know that the next one can't send out something like bone saws miasma or whatever and just you know, right. It's unstoppable. There's no, no way to counteract it. So, and I think that's what, what the undersiders were trying to get across mm-hmm. to the protector. It was that, all right, you might think you can understand Noel slash Echidna, but you don't understand that anything could come out of her. And we have some inkling, but it could be way worse than you think. So let's just plan for the worst. And the right. protector was kind of like, ah, that'll probably be okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, don't worry God. about it. It'll be fine. We can, <laughs> yeah. We can handle it. 
We got this. <laughs> the skitters try to play mind games with Tattletail, and Tattletail's not worried about it. She can uh, hold her own in a in a mental joust. But one of the skitters does call out the fact that, as she said, for a girl who calls herself Tattletail, you're awfully fond of keeping secrets, and tries to nettle Tattletail for not sharing personal information like uh, her trigger event. I mean, that's a truth that our Taylor would be keeping to herself. She wants to know, but she respects her friend's privacy. Whereas the this, this pseudo skitter is used, trying to use that as a weapon against Tattletail. Right. And you can see how that would flow through this, right? Where Echidna's tried to use the clones in ways to not only just be destructive and violent, but where possible utilize their knowledge to mess up and mess with the the people that are trying to fight her. And so that's that's pretty bad. But they're not they're not tattletale, right? So they're yeah. they're trying to they're trying to battle the master here. And the master's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, just like, yeah, okay. You know, just putting one hand behind her back and just kind of saying, Yeah, no, that's not gonna work. <laughs> and 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 not even really when she responds to them, she doesn't give them anything because she knows that they would just take whatever they gave her and try to twist it. So right. she gives very short answers to them and doesn't really pass anything off. There was a, another terrifying moment when a pseudo regent showed up and Tattletail dropped her gun. I didn't get that at first, but yeah, as Wild Bull writes, she dropped the gun on purpose because Regent had her start choking herself with her free hand. And if she'd have had that gun in her hand, it would have been bye-bye tattletale because that Regent would have had her shoot herself. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was terrifying. And then I was even more freaked out when Shatterbird got out. Yes. Uh, apparently Regent got his cause he went to the room and Shatterbird exacted her revenge. I don't want to, gloss over that shattered bird's been let me see here yes let me read this one section it says um shattered bird panted her face was beaded with sweat and it wasn't related to the scene she was looking out looking at not the underground underground base filled with flesh and bodies her hands shook as she pushed hair out of her face emotion well of course it's emotion because uh, she's been a meat puppet since the Undersiders took her back in the S9 arc. Now, we're not going to feel sorry for this murdering psychopath, but you can just imagine how, how it's been for the first time in ho- however many weeks or months. She's finally free and able to move of her own accord. No doubt. Yeah, I. there was... Uh a Marvel series, Jessica Jones, I think, oh, where yeah. I think Tennant played a character that was like a regent type character. Mm-hmm. And I thought that really portrayed well how how huge a violation that would be and how it would be so hard to cope with even once you were free. You know, just that it wasn't me, but it was me that did all right. of that. And so yeah, it's kind of uh yeah, being set free from a, a prison, but it turns out the locked cell door was under 50 feet of freezing water. So it's it's like, well, okay, yeah, it's, this is an improvement, I guess, but it's still pretty horrible. So The heroes show up. Miss Militia is leading a team into the base. Unfortunately, they she opens the door at the well right time slash wrong time. Shatterbird takes the opportunity to scream and uses her power we don't know ex- immediately what happens on the outside but uh tattletale gets miss militia yeah that was scary that scene where tattletale is covered in bugs and skitter is realizing that she's going she couldn't have done what tattletale did which is to yell at miss militia she's got a face full of bugs she knows what's going to happen and yet she does it anyway it warns her to, to close the door Let's see here. We move on further in the hallucinations. And as I said earlier, she 
she's dealing with seeing night and crawler and the Siberian and all these other foes that she's either fought or vanquished through victory at some point in the last number of months. And all of a sudden, well is there and she tries to warn him off, but he grabs her. She's still in a haze. She doesn't know what's going on. He has cut his way into Echidna and he is affecting a rescue. Yay. Weld. That was pretty amazing. I mean, it, it stands to reason that some hero would be able to get in there and kind of be a, a human surgical instrument, if you will. Mm-hmm. But, to really see it happening from the absorbees point of view is pretty neat. And this was, this was a cool depiction of this, the way, the way uh, Wild Bo wrote, wrote this up. It was very, yeah, it was almost kind of a raise your arms and cheer moment. You're like, okay, all right. I'm seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. This, this isn't uh, all doom and gloom right now. Yeah, very, very true. Uh, pardon me, heroic moment, and I'm, I'm, I was really happy it was Weld because Weld is a good guy and he deserves to to get a moment and some respect. Yeah, moving a little further on into the chapter, Miss Militia is a little irritated that Tattletale and Rachel have fed, if you will, uh, material to a kid and giving her more to move uh, to to absorb. It's a heck of a chance that Tattletale is taking. You weigh her down with all this dead material and hopefully she can absorb it. Or if she is, it's going to take a while for her to break it down so she can absorb. They do affect an exit. Echidna is too big to move. She tries to use her power. She's ugh, she's spraying bile <laughs> and body parts out. Out. But Weld manages to bring uh, to bring out a few more capes. They take off out of the area, and Tattletail brings the roof down on top of Echidna. Yeah, one thing though that there was an interaction between what they were calling Skitter One and Skitter Two, and then or just Skitter One, I guess at that point, and Weld. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Skitter One let slip that the real Skitter had killed Thomas Calvert. Right. And so Noel is still, or Echidna is still trying to operate through these clones and cause harm to, and sow dissent. And that one was a tough thing to take, I bet, for Weld. And we see that kind of crop up later too. But but yeah, then at least they, the uh, double-stuffed Echidna <laughs> gets, gets buried, <laughs> buried under the pile and gives him a little bit of a break. Oh, jeez, boy. <laughs> Sorry. The question I was trying to get to. <laughs> so we have that heroic scene with Weld rescuing people in Echidna. And then we have, yeah, so we have that hands up cheering moment. And then Skitter One drops that. Oh, by the mm-hmm. way, uh, she killed your boss. Another one of these, <gasps> oh, no, moments from <laughs> Wild Bow. For sure. Yeah, and you could kind of see that something like that was brewing, the way mm-hmm. the Skitter clones were trying to egg on Tattletail or draw her out, and any kind of dart, any kind of upset that they can do, they're they're working on doing, and then, yeah, they find a finally found a really good, juicy bit to drop, and yeah, this isn't, uh, isn't going to go well. Yeah, I was glad that, Weld was able to rescue the dogs. I mean, mm. Rachel took a chance with her pups getting them sure. in there into the battle, but he was able to get them out. And then, as I said, they beat a hasty retreat. Yeah, we have that scene where actually Tattletail is going to implement the final two digits on the phone, the code to set off the bombs. Miss Militia stops her. And Tattletale tells her what's going on. It's like, look, you can either let me do it and your conscience can be a little more clear. But Tattletale, pardon me, Miss Militia, being the stand-up leader that she is, says, well, you know what? I don't back down from responsibility. And she punched in the numbers and then boom. Yeah, it's it's the right call. 
I get how it's going. And Tattletale kind of wanted to say, hey, I'm a villain anyway. Right. But yeah, Miss Militia says, no, this is this is us trying to stop a baby end bringer. So let let me be the one to push the button. Yeah, it's it's her job. It's her job to be in, in charge. We don't know where Vista is as of this moment. Uh, is she still in Echidna? They tried to call her on the phone. They didn't get any reply. It's not exactly where in the world is Carmen San Diego, but where's Vista? <laughs> yeah, that's that could be pretty problematic. And then there's also the the problem of the teleportation version of Gru. Yes. And that he disappeared at some point and they don't know exactly where he is. So they've bought some time, but either one of those could could make stuff change in a heartbeat. Yes. And as we're at the end of the chapter, it says here, I use my bugs to search for someone who might be able to give medical attention. A little mm-hmm. further down. Us undersiders aside, there are only two people nearby who weren't active, trying to contain and prepare for a potential second attack, Weld and Miss Militia. They were talking, and they were looking at me. Thomas Calvert, my clone, had informed them, and they'd seen our faces. Now, I had commented last episode, if you remember, about uh, how Wild Bo used the the description of the physical mutations of the clones to shield, to mask the unmasked villains. Mm, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to presume that in this point, especially given how well-spoken these clones, the skitter clones were, I'm going to presume that these were a little better formed that Echidna had, for lack of a better phrase, had, time enough to properly bake them and so maybe i don't know how else to put it man (laughs) so i'll do a kid version 14 (laughs) cloning oven available now in time for black friday yes so (laughs) so i I bring that up just because later on uh yeah let's move on into the next chapter as a matter of fact yeah, later on, Skitter does talk about the fact that Weld has seen her face. And so I'm going to presume that these clones were in decent enough physical shape that he could identify them, uh, identify her from that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm betting you're right. That that makes a lot of sense. And that's very unfortunate. And who knows how that's going to play out. But I think this really shows that, that Weld is even though he's not, uh, you know, he's still a ward, he's still uh, quite the professional about this. He Mm -hmm. knows that, you know, he needs to take what was said by these clones a little bit with a grain of salt. Right. And do, do some legwork on his own. But he also knows that even if it's true, they're all on the same side for now in this crisis situation. And so, He'll suspend judgment, if you will, a little bit right now and in the interest of working together. Yeah, he he had to report the findings. First of all, he, as you were as you were saying, he, he considered the source mm, you know, of yeah. the story. So maybe these evil clones are stretching the truth. Maybe there's some mitigating circumstances or maybe they are telling the truth. But the the temporary truce that they have in in place, much like the Endbringer situation where there's a truce and all hands on deck, hero or mm. villain. Uh, right. he, he reports to Miss Militia, but they're not going to act on it. And Skitter goes up to try to get ahead of the situation. How did you like her attempt to handle it? Okay, let me give you this side of the story. Coyle was Calvert. And here's some stuff that you may not know. What do you what do you know about Cauldron? That whole thing. What what did you make of all that? Her attempt to redirect some of the some of the suspicion. I see where she's coming from with it. I also chalk a little bit up to how beat down she is and how 
exhausted and she might not be thinking wholly clearly. Mm -hmm. But I think she's also in her own way trying to say, hey, we are all on the same team now, so I'll just come clean. And that way you're not distracted trying to imagine how the clone might have said something wrong or might have said something right. I'll just lay it out on the table. We'll put it aside for now, but you'll you'll have it there. And if we make it through this, then you can decide what to do about it. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't exactly. It was kind of a a, a non denial denial about oh, yeah. whether or not she directly was responsible for for Calvert's death. That's and, true. She kept sidestepping that part. Yeah, but she did share what she thought to be some good information with Miss Militia and uh, and Weld. And as they were parting, Miss Militia said, "Hey, I uh, don't know if you're." Well, I did like the <laughs> the one part where Miss Militia is like, "Okay, well, look, we're gonna set this aside for now, but if we find out that you did have something to do with his death, I don't suppose you'd be willing to come along, uh, uh, you know, peaceably." To, and Skitter's like, "Yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Let me, let me check. Let me check my parahuman membership card here. No, it says villain, so I'm, I'm not. I'm not allowed to do that." It's part of our union. Right, right. <laughs> oh, you know what? Uh, I don't want to blow past that discussion they had about Cauldron. I guess you could say that uh, Cauldron is kind of an urban legend amongst the parahuman community. I, I think that's a good way to frame it. Now, this can get into all, one of those huge, hairy things you know, that conspiracy theories spring out of, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, only if it was real would people be denying that it exists, you know? And it's like, oh, come on, you can't, yeah. can't go down that road. But the people who have, I mean, we know better, right? Cauldron does yes. exist. There are people that are involved in this exact event that are involved with Cauldron. And so it's definitely in their best interest to try to, downplay anything that comes out or try to slow walk any kind of investigation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Miss Militia, she calls her out. God, I just really love Miss Militia as a character. She calls her out and he says, um, as they're having that conversation. So it's really selfishness that brings you here. Miss Militia said, you don't expect to change the way you operate. And you expect to get away with acknowledging that you murdered a man, if not outright admitting it, but you want us to change how we handle our end of things based on your hearsay. So she's not taking it at face value. She uh, is, is looking at Skitter, calling her, calling her for BS a little bit, challenging her, her what she's presenting to her. But the one thing I did as we were moving on, I did want to acknowledge that Miss Militia acknowledged that she did appreciate the the data she's like hey as as they were separating well um if you are telling the truth we do appreciate i do appreciate the fact that you're sharing this with me you'll understand that i'm a little cautious these days based on the fact that my predecessor you know handled things the wrong way and he's you know out of a job yeah i thought i thought this went about as well as it could yeah and, you know, it's it is kind of a classic villain thing, you know, to s almost turn states evidence. Well, I'll give you some of it, but I want immunity. And it's like, yes. oh, OK, so you're doing it to protect yourself. So I, it totally made sense. But it it's almost like Tattletail could tell that Skitter was tap dancing around too much mm. and maybe getting to the point where she might trip up and and say something that she should. So then we have Tattletail jumping in and say, Hey, can I cut in and steal Skitter? Uh, let's step back. Okay. Taylor Hebert. She and the truth aren't necessarily close friends. Huh. That seems to have been something that's been throughout this story. I'm, I'm thinking all the way back to her relationship with her father when we first met this girl 
all the way through to now. Yeah, her and the truth aren't always the the closest of allies. I I would agree with that, but I think given her situation, losing her mom, seeing how her dad's having a hard time, the, her having a hard time at school and, and getting betrayed and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a really hard time in a teenager's life is knowing there's this perception that people have of them and that they're on the up and up on everything and that everything's great. But inside the teenager, there's this huge chaos going on and turmoil and Mm -hmm. they're trying to make sense of things. And so when a parent says, Hey, are you doing okay? I forget. I know they did it in a really old movie called better off dead, but I know they've done the same kind of thing more recently where it shows what's going on in the kid's head, you know, that he wishes a monster would come out and eat the other guy in the room, but he (laughs) says, no, I'm fine. You know, it, it becomes this thing where once the kid realizes that because by saying they're fine when they're really not fine, it is kind of lying. Once they realize that they can get away with that, then it starts becoming easier, I think, to not fess up to other things. Mm -hmm. I can remember a time when our son was really agonizing over something that happened and we could tell something was wrong, but he kept saying everything was okay. And then eventually it came out. Mm -hmm. I think the reason it came out is that he had both me and my wife. They're kind of one of, you know, playing not necessarily good cop, bad cop, but at least having different approaches to try to help him work through it and draw it out and and recognize that no matter what he said, it wouldn't destroy us. It wouldn't be devastating because that's what, what the teenager worries about, right? Because they've been devastated when somebody looked at him cross-eyed in the hall that they thought was their friend or whatever. So they're still finding things, but to your point, Yes, I would agree. Taylor is now no stranger to shading the truth or outright lying, but I would give her a little bit of a pass because that is not that different from most teenagers, I don't think. All right. Fair enough. Tattletail takes Taylor to meet Scapegoat. Not exactly a healer. Well, sort of, kind of. A very fascinating tool that wild bow brought to us this scapegoat this uh this power that he has uh how did you like his ability to flip through the the multiverse as it were and find the closest analogous the closest skitters that were out there and then pick and choose the healthy parts of them on a quantum level and he acted as a bridge to give this this the repaired physical condition to our skitter, uh, a, a unique way to do that. This was kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, this was really a stretch compared to a lot of things that uh, have come before this. And so I, I really liked it. Mm-hmm. I think it would be great if Scapegoat could try to find a tinker or something that would let him assess the person he's going to deal with first before he agrees to doing the work. Because uh, the part where he comes back and he says, you're blind. (laughs) It's like, dang. Surprise. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, Oh man. I'm just, I I like it because it's not like there's, there's healers all over the place and you know here's a healer you got a healer you got a healer and um <laughs> there, there again there were interesting restrictions in the use of his power so uh skitter's now going to first of all she's she's not happy about it because she's a she's a fighter she's like you mean i got to stay within x amount of feet of this guy and i i, I can't fight how am i supposed to fight and tattletales like hey look you're burning a candle at both ends here. You're, you're on a, on a, on a ledge. You really need some healing. So you're just going to have to take this and play nice. This one is pretty, uh, hobbled though, as far as healing type powers. Uh, this is, 
this is next level of kind of requirements and it's like some of the the emergency type care you get if you're injured and oh you can't do this you can't do that you can't do this you can't do that you're like well goodness you know can't you can't you repair things a little bit better than that so i i totally get skitter's response although you wish you would just be more grateful that she's close to 100 percent. yeah but you know they are in the middle of a battle so it's kind of like so you're tagging me out and you're never going to tag me back in is basically what you're saying i'm going to mm-hmm. have to be outside the ring the whole time from now on maybe i can yell in encouragement oh and i've got to stand next to this sweaty manager with the cane the whole time so that's <laughs> that it's lovely uh but um it's just go ahead go ahead i was just gonna make a disclaimer that i don't watch wrestling i used to a <laughs> long long time ago uh, so I'm, I'm this is not current current wrestling knowledge but what were you gonna say no no i was just Nothing in particular. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Yeah, Grace is surprised by the fact that Skitter had been operating with no vision, apparently. Uh, so, you know, take that, Grace. Um, <laughs> we move on. We come to the situation with Gru. Now, we know the horrors we can just kind of imagine the horrors that no uh echidna showed him and so it's not a surprise that he's borderline catatonic at this moment oh for sure i mean he went through something so bad that it caused another trigger event so i'm sure she was just showing him oh yeah here's a scenario where you didn't trigger and you just got to see all your friends chopped into bits and made into weird things. And Mm -hmm. then they went on to destroy your city and kill your sister. And so, yeah, I'm surprised he's not totally unconscious at this point. Or yeah. Or maybe the night that he did trigger the first time when he Mm. went to go rescue Aisha, maybe he failed. Maybe that's a vision that, that echidna shows him, or maybe echidna shows him a vision where uh, Aisha is a drug addict or something. So ew, there's right. just a multitude of of evil visions that that echidna sh- could have shown him. Yeah, there's plenty of material for her to draw from. Unfortunately, right. for for Gru, yeah. That interaction between Skitter and Imp was really something. I think that shows some genuine growth from her part on her part Mm. where she says you're the leader and she accepts skitters will not command suggestion that she take her brother home away from the, from the battle. Good on, good on him. Yeah. And you know, we've seen that with, with the whole crew, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they tend to be immature because they're younger teenagers. Then they get put through the crucible of being in these battles, having to make, decisions that even adults most adults don't have to make you know like oh well if i don't kill this person they're going to kill all these other people so i got to do this this is like no no teenager should be forced to make that although plenty of our men and women in the armed forces as teenagers have had to do that uh, in conflicts all over the place so it's it's not unheard of but it definitely makes a huge impact on people and i think we're seeing that with imp that she's maturing at an accelerated rate because of the horrors that they're all having to battle through. Yes. And you know, 10 minutes ago she was inside Coyle's base cutting the throats of clones. She's been playing assassin this entire thing, this, uh, this entire battle with a a kidna. Uh, so yeah, to your point, she's been dealing out death and right she's having to face that. And in this moment where she could, uh, you know, two, three arcs ago, that imp would have got in Skitter's plate in Skitter's face and said, don't you tell me what to do. Uh, and now she says, uh, you're the leader and accepts her recommendation and takes her brother out of the combat zone. Yeah. Or imp could have even turned it back on Skitter. You know, he wouldn't be this messed up if it wasn't for you. And, True. How you dragged him in to fight the nine and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Alexandria, Legend, Mirrodin, Chevalier show up. 
And yeah, as it says here, they're they're finally getting the big guns and they're finally treating this as a class S threat. Again, a scene where we're all standing around going, yay. And then <laughs> five seconds later, Tattletale says cauldron. And we're all going, <laughs> oh, no. Sk- <laughs> What's funny is, you know, Skitter even knows she sees that look. And, and it says here, I'd seen that kind of smile. Had seen it on Emma's face. So, yeah, Taylor knew that grin that Tattletale was sporting. Something was up. And she tried to catch her, and it was too late. And she, Tattletale drops a bomb. And from looking at everybody's physical response, she gets the information that she wants. Yeah. But she also, yeah, she just basically poops in the room. So Mm -hmm. nobody's happy now. No, not at all. And we move on into chapter three. She does try to reason with her, explain to uh, Skitter tries to reason with Tattletail saying, look, this is not the time to have done that. And Tattletail's like, hey, this was the only shot I was going to have to do this with all all three of them nearby. So I, I, I got the information I wanted. So we'll let it go and we'll move on. They catch back up with the wards. We meet some of the the West wards, I guess, uh, this gully girl and some of her team gully is another case 53. Yes. So we meet the wards. They're sitting on top of the travelers, ballistic Sundancer and scrub who are all in ugh, encased in foam in containment foam. Tecton greets gully. They discuss their teams Tattletail asks to talk to the travelers. Tecton says, okay, fine. Uh, this is Gully, but you better treat her with respect or you're not going to get any further cooperation from me. Nice interaction between those two, and Skitter, Skitter notices the camaraderie. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, she had hoped for that with different groups they had worked with. One thing I did want to touch on, though, was that, mm-hmm. you know, they're really worried about Raymancer still. Yeah. You know, he's looking like he's not going to make it. So everybody's pretty bummed out about that. But it's neat to see that, and especially, you know, Regent being Regent, you know, immediately oh. just judges a book by its cover. But <laughs> uh, Tecton is like, no, she's cool. And yeah, if you disrespect her, then forget it. Yes. So that was, that was a neat interaction there. I, I agree with that. Let's see here. Yeah, you know what? I did have this when they were talking about Shatterbird and whether or not she would be willing to to join forces with Echidna. And Tattletale says she could see it. She would do it just to mess them over. Well, I mean, you know, she's <laughs> she's she's an uber supervillain, and you guys again had her as a meat puppet, so. I'm not sure how I feel about Tattletales. She would join up with a kidna just to mess us over. I mean, yeah. I mean, you see, you see the point I'm trying to make here. I'm not doing a good. Yeah, job at it. that's 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 a tough one. It's kind of a toss up for me. Like you said, she's got to have revenge as a as a top level priority on her mind. But she's one of the nine. You know, she. I think it would be hard for her to subvert her superiority complex and willingly get ingested by echidna Mm. just to help have more of her clones out there i I don't know if it's a, a a prideful thing or what but i think it would be hard for her to overcome that almost like saying like i need your help Mm -hmm. and i think you got a i think you got a point because that, that immediately brings back her confrontation with um was it hook wolf when she was trying to recruit mm. him and you could get that air of as you put it an air of superiority in her, her interactions with him so maybe you're on to something but i mean who knows like you you keep coming back to and i can't i don't think it'd be said enough to be put through what she was put through where she's conscious of what's going on but unable to control what she's doing and does all these things that are against what she would have done. Mm-hmm. 
that that might be enough to overcome that pride and just say, I don't care what I got to do, but they're going down. So I, I, it's a coin flip for me. I could see it going either way. Yeah. Tattletale's little experiment. She's got a theory on what Scrub's power actually is. And we get a nice build up there where uh, she goes over and she's sitting down watching Scrub. And every now and again, his com- controlled or pardon me, his uncontrolled power uh, burst next to her. Well, nearby. And it's in the air. It's in the air. And then eventually one of the times uh, a flash of light intersects with the ground. And that's how Tattletail believes she confirms a theory about exactly what his power is doing. He's not annihilating anything. He's swapping out, not unlike what Scapegoat was doing. He's swapping mm. out materials from one reality to another. If if it hadn't been for the Scapegoat scene, this would have been pretty hard to swallow. Even though Tattletail goes into a lengthy description of her theories behind it, it's just kind of like, wait, what? You mm-hmm. know, this... Um... Well, let me let me stop you there. Okay. I want to talk about the the multiverse aspect of it. You t- you talked about how having seen scapegoats power in action helped helped get you to to accept what uh, what Scrub is doing. Wild Bo has kind of laid, or do you think Wild Bo? has effectively laid the groundwork for this to be realized at this moment in the story. We, he didn't dump a multiverse on us immediately. There were kind of hints throughout the course of the story, maybe a little more here, a little more there. And, and now we are at this point where a, yeah, Taylor gets quote unquote healed by a guy paging through realities to find physically fit versions of herself and B scrub is actually shunting materials from run one world to another small baby steps to get you to this point. You feel you were effectively led here. I think so. I mean, it did come up pretty early on where they were, they were in the headquarters watching TV from an alternate earth, right? Uh, which was one of the few things that you could do. So the, the multi work, Multiverse groundwork was there, but up for quite a while, it was kind of this super limited or very few folks can can do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And so there is somewhat of a ramp up here, but I would say that goes back all the way to the Seamurg and how the Travelers got started. So that's true. Once that genie was kind of fully mm-hmm. let out of the bottle, then it further expanded this to where it's like, all right, well, yeah. Okay. So I think it was a bit of a leap or a, a bit of an acceleration on this. But yeah, Scapegoat knew what he was doing and kind of was able to explain it. So then that it made it more believable when Tattletail was theorizing about it with without Scrub saying it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've forgotten about the the Traveler's Arc and the fact that the Seamurg is actually dumping people from different uh, mm. different reality and or yeah into where they are now. So yeah, between then and now, uh, whether or not Tattletail was a knew what had happened, yeah, okay, she's she's trying to put her theory to the test. Uh, did you like how? how uh, Gully was able to elevate that yeah. section of the road and a uh, nice display of her power. That was pretty cool. Yeah. When it first described her there with her shovel, I immediately mm-hmm. thought of that goofy movie. Mystery. Where one of the, the mystery men. Exactly. Where one <laughs> of them was the shoveler. <laughs> I was like, what did she just whack people with it? That's kind of, <laughs> that's a little underpowered maybe. Mm-hmm. But this was pretty cool. Yeah, where it's just like it could just segment things like that. That's pretty neat. And then we get Tattletail in her, as she said, her murder she wrote moment where she explains 
what she believes is actually happening and how scrub is in fact moving materials between realities pretty good information dump good setup by wild bow and then we get this payoff so of course you would expect a detailed explanation from tattletale she's given us a knowledge dump and it's believable doesn't detract from the story it's fascinating what she's what she's getting up to what she's bringing uh, forth to share with everybody oh i i totally agree yeah this is this is really interesting and it it does explain some stuff like why people who have the power to control fire or the, the heat of the sun aren't burned by that and yeah there's the aspect of well if it was just one other thing that was kind of swapping out then you'd basically have people being roasted Mm -hmm. in that other thing so then it's spread out and everything across the multiverse and and whoever knows how many different realities are out there but yeah this having having a called kind of a murder she wrote moment was pretty Mm -hmm. funny i want us to go all the way back to the merchant's little murderous mayhem get together they Mm. had i think it was arc 10 where Scrub first triggered. And I want to read this little bit here from Tattletail. When Skitter comes up to Tattletail after they see their trigger vision and Tattletail is still a little bit out of it, Lisa's a little bit out of it. And Lisa says, as uh, says, as Taylor's talking to her, trying to bring her back, she says, they're like viruses. She said, her voice was thin as if she were talking to herself and babies and gods all at the same time. We have that statement with mm. toward the end of this, uh, this explanation where Tattletail says, what if they're not small? What if they're immensely huge? Cause she's debating like with Skitter, this mental power, this hat that she has, where's that, that work being done. And then she talks about how bone saw was talking about the passengers possibly being the, like small. And that's where Tattletail's making the leap to, well, what, what if they're large? What if they're immense? Mm. And that's, that's kind of a, a meta question, right? It, mm-hmm. A lot of what we deal with is we tend to focus on the microscopic level, but it's really a giant system. You know, when, when you ask Alexa what the weather forecast is going to be, she's extrapolating or this weather report is extrapolating from data in a wide area around your location and trying to come up with what's going on. But there are all sorts of variables. What matters really to the person, though, is am I going to step outside? Is it raining right where I am? And so those two things are connected mm-hmm. that that one raindrop that hits you on the head is part of weather, but it's hard to, it's hard for our minds to wrap around weather. If you're thinking about inside of somebody's head or their body, uh, the traveler is just small. It's, it's fibers or it's, it's whatever, but it's connected. It's part of this this overarching thing is what Tattletale is trying to say. And Mm -hmm. it's just really hard with our consciousness to grasp, I think, things that are big like weather. When you're talking on a on a huge macro scale, it gets pretty fuzzy pretty fast. So as we are heading toward the end of this chapter, Tattletail has one more thing that she wants to do. She believes she has something she can offer to the travelers. And we know that the one thing the travelers want is to go home. Mm. And this goes to why she called fault line and wants to borrow labyrinth because um, (laughs) Tattletail says she thinks she can tear a hole between dimensions. (laughs) Ta-da. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, this girl. She's just 
winging it. I mean, well, no, that's not fair. She's not winging it. She's just out there uh, living, living her best life, using her thinker power to, uh, to cause all kinds of mischief and mayhem and, and <laughs> having a grand old time doing it. Yeah. It, it reminded me of that scene from, uh, national treasure. Do you remember that movie with Nicholas cage? Oh, geez. I, I, didn't see it all the way through i don't think no but i remember the movie yeah oh well you should you should watch it it was it was yeah here definitely it was good. worth it but you know all through the movie nicholas cage and then the the girl that he is associated with are these experts on u.s history and the history of washington dc and right. philadelphia and everything and and the kind of the sidekick that's going along with them his assistant is you know he's more of a science guy Mm -hmm. And so he's constantly a step behind and, and you can tell that they're Nicholas Cage and the girl kind of really enjoyed how they're finishing each other's sentences because they know the same stuff and the other guy's feeling really left out. But then mm -hmm. it gets to a point where they come upon a clue and they're like, oh man, you know, and then all of a sudden he's like, oh, hold on a minute. Ah. And then he looks at him and he's like, now I know what it's like to be you. I know something that you haven't figured out yet. This is great. I really like, they're like, tell us, tell us. What it is. <laughs> and then he finally tells them and they're like, of course. And so then it turns out, you know, they go back, back on their mission because there's still time. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I, that's the feeling you get, or I get anyway, from Tattletale kind of, uh, I wouldn't say gloating that she's. Uh, yeah, go ahead and say it. <laughs> gloating that she's figured this stuff out but yeah you can just see that she's loving springing this stuff on him and everybody's just like i hope you say something cool oh that's yeah no and even rachel is like i'm not i'm not making my dogs do that again so no, no don't come up with anything in that kind of plan and she's like no it's even better we're just gonna <laughs> yeah, rip a hole in the space-time continuum no big deal like oh for Tattletale, it's just Tuesday. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move on to interlude 19. It's a bonus interlude. And it's the last item we will be covering this episode. And we get to meet up with Ray or Blasto. And Blasto is on his way to have a meeting with Accord. Now, if you remember during the Traveler's arc, that was when trickster was going to meet with accord to seek permission for the travelers to operate in his area and accord was going to hire them to take out blast or to steal some items from blasto that's another circle that's being closed you remember that okay. yep it's nice again to see these these individuals these um items come together something that was on one part of the story now being realized here in in this particular moment I believe remnants of the, not the pure remnants of the chosen have taken up residence in Ray's area of, uh, of Boston and they ran him out of his block. And now Ray is, uh, or Blasto was forced to come to accord to come and partner up with him. And Accord's going to hire him to produce something that's going to take out some of his enemies. And that's, you know, their business operation. So we've got several elements coming together, things that happen in Brockton Bay or in Boston that we know from the story. And now they're showing up together here at this moment. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tense situation and they haven't obviously seen eye to eye on a lot of things, but yeah, they're trying to come up with a way to work together and uh, achieve mutually beneficial goals and and while Bo has kind of made made a habit of this and it's a good habit of really showing kind of opposite ends of a spectrum mm -hmm. when different groups get together so you have a cord who is a gentleman's gentleman dressed to the nines and then ray who is basically a tinker pothead it sounds like <laughs> and it's like yeah you could I would love for you, you know, I, I guess he doesn't say that. I would tolerate you coming to work for me, but you're going to have to use a special entrance. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, don't, don't talk, don't touch that. No, please don't. No, that's not your, 
You can't deal with it. Okay, no, just just go over in the corner. I don't want to even look at you. And so it's kind of like, uh, all right. Well, if I wasn't in such bad straits and running low on on my stash, then uh, I probably wouldn't take this. But I need some money for some Mary Jane. So let's go ahead with the the transaction. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was uh, a, a fun little moment between these guys. Uh, you know, they have their meeting, they come to terms, and Ray heads downstairs in this beautiful, what sounds like a beautiful lab, and he gets to work uh, making himself a homunculus and trying to make himself an inbringer and, you know, just another day. Well, and and I can imagine how he must have been drooling over this data hall that Accord has. Oh, you right. Know, the samples and the write-ups on the, the capes and stuff. And it's it just, it seems like there's a few gaps, but it's pretty complete. And I, uh, he I almost need can't... help remembering where he got that from. Now, he knew, he knew Coil. Right. Okay, so I'm going to need help from some of the listeners um is this that database that coil had the undersider still i believe it is yeah that's what it sounded okay. like to me okay then all right i'm 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 playing catch up here didn't mean to interrupt uh, did you have more to to say on that no no i i guess the the one thing that was cool was that he's not only drooling over the lab equipment and the database mm-hmm. but his his head is just blowing up with the possibilities you know and he almost doesn't know where to start and he's just like oh i could do this or i could do that oh what about this you know and then i don't know i i'm guessing that he had some requirements that he was moving toward and everything but dang tampering with an end bringer <laughs> dude yeah right that's that's like in the movies where there's like the level three containment of plagues that people are working on and stuff to try to find a cure. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, d- don't put on the don't go in that room. Don't mm-hmm. just don't even go in there. You don't want to deal with that stuff. But right away, he's just like, hey, let's try it in. <laughs> Cut your teeth on something <laughs> a little bit. A couple couple rungs down first, maybe. and But. His inhibitions might be a little bit dampened at the moment. <laughs> yes. So he gets to work rifling through all this data and the samples and, and beginning to create some of his, uh, as I said, a, a homunculus to help him uh, to, to act as a lab assistant. Accord has hit some of his ambassadors babysitting uh, Blasto while he's getting, uh, getting set up and, and starting his experiments. And one of the uh, one of the ambassadors, while while Ray is working, is watching the television. Uh, oh yeah, that's correct. Another one came down. They're relieving each other in shifts. Time is just flying by, and Ray is so involved in his work, he doesn't realize uh, what I'm assuming are hours are just passing by because the ambassadors mm-hmm. are swapping swapping out, you know, from one shift to another. They're watching television during one of these shift change over. And there's a battle out in the streets of Boston. A couple of dragon suits are in the area fighting what we later find out were the Slaughterhouse Nine. Good time to be in Boston. <laughs> Let's see. Brockton Bay is devastated. Where should we go? Hmm, what's what's a what's a good tourist attraction <laughs> place this time of year? Boston. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Boston. Oh goodness. Yeah, dude. So. <laughs> The nine just gonna go where they're gonna go, but at least at least Dragon and Defiant are in the area, and we find out that they their response time was really quick once the nine their faces showed up on the screen. Mm. Secure what I'm guessing were security cameras. They're in Boston looking for a tinker, and it turns out that this this Ray this Blasto guy happens to be the one that they're they're looking for, and he gets a visit from Bonesaw. This whole thing with her was really horrifying. The description of how that that fight with Defiant and how he slices her in half, and then that whole thing with the prehensile spine. Uh, why don't you take it away from there? Take it from there. 
Yeah, this is the stuff of which nightmares are made. Yes. And you know Defiant and Dragon have run scenario after scenario and analyzed and and got the best strategy possible. And there's still stuff they didn't account for. And Mm -hmm. you think, oh, yeah, sliced her in half. Well, almost in half. Oh, yeah, well, we'll stick her, stick a blade through her. Oh, well, no, she's got everything protected. And, oh, well, I'll have these blades. It'll start chopping her up. And, oh, no, she'll just pull herself along or try to find a way to jam the blade. And, like, oh, my gosh. But, yeah, then the kicker is she turns into basically, like, the alien creature and her (laughs) what's left of her is kind of, I mean, it reminded me of, uh, oh, I can't think of the character's name in the second alien movie where, you know, he gets cut in half. Oh, Bishop. Bishop is pulling himself along the floor and <laughs> white stuff's coming out of his mouth, you know, and I, I had flashbacks to that. But then she, like, not only starts choking poor Ray, mm-hmm. and you think, all right, that's bad enough, you know, and maybe he'll come up with something and they'll be able to stop it. But then she just basically, like, puppetizes him. You know, mm-hmm. she, she has the wherewithal in her prehensile uh, spinal cord to slide into her victim's spinal cord these fibers and stuff and then yeah all of a sudden she's driving the bus and it's just oh so and he's conscious he's conscious right i mean I, it's, <laughs> it's not even like she could be bothered to you know put him to sleep he's she's just uh okay uh why don't you i'm gonna operate your hands and i have my hands and you're gonna walk this way for me and you, you you're such a good little pinocchio you know <laughs> right and oh, i just got a new set of legs before and now i'm <laughs> uh, dang it i've got it i guess you'll have to do and it's like what what is bone saw up to she's very happy to have collected a whole bunch of stuff what do you think she's up to well, I think she says something about it at some point where she says Jack thought things weren't moving along fast enough. Oh, right. So yeah. we're, we're trying to come up with, we knew this database, this these materials were out there. So we thought, wouldn't it be a way to crank up the, the violence if we could find somebody who could do things with the samples and get the samples themselves? Oh, this would be great. Yeah, and so that's why they that's what drew them to to Ray. And it was going to the grocery store, everything they could possibly want, including the seeds as he called them, the mm. items that served as kind of a bridge between his his animal plant hybrids. Yeah, in many ways this is kind of a a worst case scenario for people people who aren't in the slaughterhouse nine (laughs) for sure now one thing that i thought was kind of wild was when you know ray had been working on morrigan Mm -hmm. which was his kind of melding of chevalier and uh seamurg and bonesaw has the opportunity to take that too and she's like nah even i'm not that crazy yeah (laughs) right (laughs) What does that say about Ray? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> Thank you. That was my <laughs> thinking. It's like Bonesaw don't care about nothing. You know, right. she'll try anything, but she looks at that thing and says, yeah, nah, nah, man. That's a bridge too far for me even. If it's, yeah, you you got to be out there if, if even Bonesaw is, is taking a step back. But it's interesting that she, it sounds like she, nukes it through the laser system that's set up to get rid of clones Mm. that aren't going the way Ray wants them to, but he didn't see it. He could smell burning flesh. So there could be, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking that maybe it didn't get all of Morgan and we shall see her again. (laughs) So poor defiant, he's doing his best to try to kill this person to no avail like you said she's got all kinds of tricks up her sleeve and and defiant ends up being uh, in some kind of goop he's captured by that mm, yeah. and bonesaw and her wearing her blasto suit using <laughs> her blasto puppet makes an escape down the 
down the sewers, I believe it was. Right. And that's that. She heads on out. The scene jumps, and Dragon is there with Defiant, kind of uh, getting him, using a mist to get him from uh, inside that containment foam, if you will. And they discuss strategy. He's pretty disappointed, talking about the need for more tech in his body. It's been a while since we've seen these two, and we don't know how much more cyborg, how much more machine Colin is than he is man. It's interesting, though, the two of them are acting more like a couple. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of kind of closer there. So whether or not they're more or less hardware or not, there's still feelings in there and emotions. So that's that's pretty interesting. But, yeah, the other thing is that even though Defiant wasn't successful, Dragon had some success. That's right. Ding dong, the Siberian's dead. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, Manton's <laughs> dead, but uh, that, that means Siberian's gone too, but yeah. So they had, they had some good success, but you know, I think he must have a decent amount of person in him because when they step out, he opens up vents so he can feel the cool air. Mm -hmm. So there must be at least some of his skin inside there and a decent amount where he opened, you know, he opened one event under his armpit or whatever. Sure. He feels cool <laughs> air there. So some of them's left, but yeah, he just wants to keep adding on, you know, he wants thorns that'll spring out of, out of him and stuff. And he's, he's still, still doing the cosmetic surgery, so to speak, willing to keep doing the going under the knife. Yeah. And he's walking a dangerous path. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure Alan, I forget his name. I'm sure Mannequin uh, thought that it, it would be just the little little things here and the little things there. And the next thing you know, he's encased his vital organs inside of plastic. So yeah. watch out to find it. And I think it shows an interesting juxtaposition here. Colin opens the vent so he can feel the air flow through uh -huh. the suit. But then it says dragon luxuriated, luxuriated in the feel of the air against her exterior body. So dragon has developed the software enough to where she's whatever she's perceiving from the exterior surface of this suit mm -hmm. is she's able to categorize that as being luxurious, which is a pretty abstract concept. And so you get the feeling that Dragon would be able to help Colin maintain sanity, or at least she's feeling like she would be mm -hmm. able to. That's kind of the implication I got from it, I guess, that the more Colin turns into a machine, Dragon will be able to help him with that transition. But yeah, I think that's a legit fear, is that it's a thin line that he could turn into a mannequin too. Is this... <laughs> this is irony is this AI going to be able to help Colin hold on <laughs> to his humanity that's yeah that's that's a huge question <laughs> well hang on to that yeah. I mean don't don't okay. pose an answer now let's just leave that one out there and uh, okay out there to eat there and we'll, we'll see what happens I'll let it I'll let it percolate see see what comes out sounds good man sounds good and with that that brings us to the end of the interlude. Um, any last words, any final thoughts on what we covered this uh, episode? I really liked Ray. He's like one of those characters in a Shakespearean play where, wow, that's really great. And then they get killed at the end of the scene. You're <laughs> like, what the heck? I just, I just, I, I really like that character. So that was too bad. I guess he's still there. <laughs> In a matter sense. of speaking, sure. But uh, yeah, somehow I don't think he's going to be the same after this. No, he won't be there for long after she gets the leg she wants. So there's that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, gr so grim. But um, I really like this section. Yeah, there was a lot of neat twists and turns. I like the expansion on the traveler or the uh, uh, passengers. Mm -hmm. What? 
the multiverse and how that might all interlink. That was really cool. But yeah, I, I, I want to write Wild Bow and say, can you write a story about Ray where he lives longer than <laughs> one one chunk? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. And that brings us to the end of part one. In part two, we will review chapters four through six. And with that, we will be signing off for now. Thanks for spending time with us, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Come catch up with us as we return for part two. So until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening. As always, we're having a great time with this. and uh, We hope you are as well. And also hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving if you'll be celebrating. So much to be grateful for. One of the things we're grateful for is that we get to do this and you're enjoying it. So until next time, have a good break. Hopefully you get time off from work at least. Thanks for joining us in this podcast. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we'll hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more in the link down below. Catch you later.